You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Good morning, I'm Chrissy DeClerc Salagi. And I'm Jason Salagi with today's Caffeinated History with the Salagis on the BQN Podcast Collective. Before we jump into our topic for the day, we'd like to take a moment to thank our BQN Patreon patrons who make this show possible. Listeners, you can hear your name listed here as one of our associate producers with a monthly subscription of just $10 at patreon.com slash bqn. And with a monthly Patreon subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings of the hive mind on the second Saturday of each month. Watch your Patreon messages for details. Today's topic is the Krupp family. This topic was prompted by the story of Bertha Krupp, whose marriage arrangements were overseen by Kaiser Wilhelm II because it would have been unseemly for a daughter to inherit the family business. If you've heard the name Krupp, you have likely associated it with two things, German industrial manufacturing or their contributions to the German military in World War II. But the company goes back much, much further. It began with Arndt Krupp in 1587, who made the family fortune buying up and reselling houses and property around the independent city-state of Essen, which was part of the Holy Roman Empire, and in the western part of the modern state of Germany. His son, Anton, put money into producing guns during the Thirty Years' War, beginning an association with the Krupps and the German war machine that lasted over three centuries. The family's primary income stayed with real estate and trade until the late 1700s, when they got involved in coal and iron mining and held ownership over some cloth mills and a factory that produced tobacco in the form of snooze. In 1800, the family purchased an iron forge, allowing them to process the iron they were mining in-house. These large and lucrative investments were all done under the leadership of Helene Amelie Asherfield Krupp, better known as the Widow Krupp, a status she acquired at the age of 25 in 1757. It was not unusual as we tend to think for a woman to take over the family business in this era, particularly the widow of the owner. She maintained control of most of it until her death in 1810. The family and company were so successful under her leadership that she is credited with the foundation of the Krupp industrial dynasty, despite it having been begun under her great-great-grandfather Arndt. Her successor, her grandson Friedrich, was not as successful. In his first foray into business at age 19, he caused a previously profitable iron forge to become so unprofitable as to require his grandmother to sell it less than two years after he began running it. Friedrich did have a purpose in mind with some of the money he spent, however, to figure out the process of casting steel. He was moderately successful in this, producing smelted rather than cast steel by 1816. While he was chasing this, his wife, Therese, was making sure the company stayed afloat. When Friedrich died in 1826, the company passed to his 14-year-old son Alfred, but was actually run by Therese. They barely broke even until 1841, when another of her sons, Hermann, invented and patented the spoon roller. Sales of this brought in enough money to expand to cast steel products. The company became more associated with weapons manufacture at the 1851 Great Exhibition in London, where they showed the first cannon made entirely of cast steel, and the largest cast steel ingot produced to that point. In that same year, Krupp began producing railway parts, exporting a massive number of these to the United States. This business provided the money that allowed Alfred to focus on weaponry. He developed a breech-loading cannon that earned Krupp a contract to supply the Prussian military beginning in 1859. These proved their worth in the Franco-Prussian War, which inadvertently became a contest between Krupp's breech-loading steel cannons and traditional bronze ones. Alfred Krupp established the company as a sole proprietorship the ownership of which was to be passed by primogeniture, meaning it went to the firstborn son. He also put into practice strict oversight of employees, which was mitigated by the social benefits that came with employment by Krupp. He made Essen a company town, with the company providing housing and schools. Employees had insurance in case of their death, and widows were given rent-free accommodation. This was intended to offset and distract from requirements like an oath of loyalty to the company over all else. Alfred Krupp was more devoted to his work than his wife, and so she spent most of their marriage away from Essen with their son Friedrich Alfred, known as Fritz. When Fritz inherited in 1887, he continued to focus on weaponry and railroad parts, but also put a great deal of money into research and development. From this, the company created Nickel Steel, which they then used to produce warships and U-boats through Krupp's purchase of the main warship manufacturing company in Germany. This success made Fritz part of powerful circles. 
He was a member of Prussia's House of Lords and then the German Reichstag. He counted Kaiser Wilhelm II as a friend. His powerful public position and reputation allowed him cover for his personal life, where he expressed his otherwise closeted homosexuality, which was illegal in Germany. When he was outed in the German press, the Kaiser defended him, including supporting him in a lawsuit against one of the papers. In 1902, Fritz's wife Marguerite was sent anonymous letters and photographs exposing her husband. She asked the Kaiser for help in this matter and found herself committed to an asylum for the trouble. Further allegations and demands that he be arrested were published in October and November of 1902. Fritz Krupp was found dead on the 22nd of November in 1902 in an alleged suicide. Fritz and Marguerite had two daughters and no sons, so ownership of the company passed to the eldest daughter, Bertha. This was the third time a woman had inherited control of the company, but the first time it was perceived to be a problem. Admittedly, Bertha was only 16 when her father died, but the problem had more to do with the social climate of -of turn-of-the-century Germany. Influenced greatly by Kaiser Wilhelm, the company was removed from her sole proprietorship and incorporated, but Bertha retained a controlling stock with only four of the company's shares out of her hands. The Kaiser then began a search for a husband for Bertha to assure that those shares would be correctly handled. He found Gustav von Bolen und Holbach, an established member of the diplomatic corps and a grandson of General Henry Bolen, who had fought on the Union side of the American Civil War. In his speech at the wedding, the Kaiser announced that Gustav would be allowed slash required the unusual instance of taking his wife's name. Their eldest son, Alfred, inherited both his mother's surname, Krupp, and his father's, Boland und Holbach. The rest of the seven children had only their father's surname. It does not seem that Bertha's opinions on the matter were recorded. At the beginning of World War I, Krupp redirected most of its manufacturing to arms, providing so much that Gustav was named a war criminal, though he was never tried. After the war, prevented by the Treaty of Versailles from producing arms, the company shifted to consumer products and some industrial steel. The Chrysler building was capped with Krupp-made steel in 1929. They did also do some arms development, in violation of the treaty, which was handled by a Swedish intermediary company. As the Nazis grew more powerful, Gustav became enamored with Nazi ideology, but he, and Bertha, disliked Hitler personally. Even so, when Hitler offered Gustav the position of chairman of the Reich Federation of German Industry, he took it. With this authority, he removed Jewish people from its sub-organizations and made sure that Krupp was a key part of Hitler's secret rearmament programs. Despite the potential benefit, Gustav was critical of Hitler's expansionist foreign policy, particularly after he violated the Munich Agreement. By the time the war began in 1939, Gustav had been displaced in the company by his son, Alfred. Alfred was a true believer in Nazism, to the point of holding a purchase position in the SS. Hitler arranged that the company go back to a sole proprietorship, and all of Bertha's holdings were transferred to her son. Gustav remained involved in the day-to-day operations, regularly spending his days at the office, but with greatly decreased authority after a stroke caused a decline in his cognitive abilities. As Germany occupied more and more of Europe, Krupp took over related industrial sites, essentially as spoils of war. Alfred also actively and willingly employed slave labor collected from concentration camps. The Krupp operations were almost completely destroyed in Allied bombing, and the city of Essen ended up in the British occupation zone at the end of the war. Both Alfred and Gustav were accused of war crimes and brought to Nuremberg for trial. Gustav was excused on the basis of dementia, but was the only German to be accused of war crimes in both world wars. Alfred was convicted of crimes against humanity, with a sentence of 12 years in prison and the loss of all of his property. He served only two years of that sentence, however, because he was granted amnesty by the High Commissioner of the American Zone in 1951, on the basis that he and the Krupp Company were useful in rebuilding Europe. Krupp spent the post-war years focusing on the more profitable elements of the business, buying up related companies around the world, and using advertising and public relations in hopes that people would forget that the Krupp name was stamped on much of the Nazi war machine. By the end of the 1950s, Alfred Krupp was the richest man in Europe. His son, Arndt, had no interest in running the company, and so it was reorganized and again incorporated. A research foundation was added under the same name. Krupp merged with Thiessen in 1999 and still produces steel and industrial products. At the time of this recording, the CEO of Thyssen Krupp is Martina Mertz, who has been called the most important woman in the German economy. Thank you for listening. We'd also like to thank our History with the Zalagis Patreon patrons, Patty, Susan Capuzzi de Clerc, Laura Dahl, Chris Hill, Betty Larson, and Vince Locke. Their contributions help us to have the time to research and write what you're hearing. You can help us just like they do with a monthly subscription at patreon.com slash history with the Zalagis. Also, thank you to Mark White for the awesome show art and Zach Tripp for the wonderful closing music. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player and don't forget to rate and review us there as well. And while you're at it, check out the rest of the great shows on the BQN Collective. We'd love to hear what you think. 
If you'd like to reach out, you can find our network on Twitter, slash X, at BQN Podcasts, and this podcast in particular at History's Logging. You can also find us at those handles on Blue Sky. You can talk about any and all of the BQN podcasts in our Facebook group, the BQN Collective. And last but not least, you can find me on Twitter X and Blue Sky at the Goddess Livia. That's T H E G O D D E S S L I V I A. And me at Jason Dark Elf. We love to hear topic suggestions. What would you like to learn on caffeinated history? Mm-hmm.